<laughs> TEDx is all about ideas worth spreading. As somebody whose body has spread, I get to talk to that. Perils of a fat woman, let me define. I do not use the word fat as a word with any negative connotation. I am fat, blue-haired, and quite beautiful. Just ask me. But the dictionary defines the word fat as having a large amount of excess flesh. When people look at me, they see a large amount of excess flesh. But yet I'm so much more. Perils means to cause danger or loss. Through my journey, I have lost a waistline, but I have gained in knowledge and strength enough to transform my life and influence others. When TEDx asked, what qualifications do you have to be an expert on this topic? My answer was simple, I'm fat. <laughs> I'm here today to reclaim the word fat. I reclaim that word to take the power away from people who will use the word fat to cause shame and hurt to people who may be similar to me in size, but not able to fight for themselves. Myself and 5.3 million Canadians are classed as obese. So what can we do to help change the situation? My hope is to share some of my experiences, my hard-earned lessons on how I became happy in this body, this fat body, and how I became a woman who controls her own power. There are many misconceptions that persist about people who may be fluffier than what is considered correct. But what is correct, normal, appropriate, or even healthy? In years gone by, the way to determine correct was by use of the body mass index system. This system was developed in the 1830s by a man who was an astronomer and a statistician, which means our health was determined by the stars and some numbers. Now, it was last revised in 1998. Now, if we take a moment to look at this chart, there's interesting observations to be made. For myself, I am five foot nine wide, oh crap, I'm five foot nine tall, and I'm 250 pounds, which puts me as morbidly obese. You'll see me on the far end there. But I have a theory. I am not morbidly obese. I am simply short for my weight. <laughs> now, if we go back to the chart, as a woman who's still growing, once I reach my full growth potential of about nine foot two, I will be classed as normal. And once classed as normal by the BMI chart, my life will be complete. <laughs> now, I do not override the health risks of an exaggerated BMI. And I understand that for some of us larger people, we're at risk of certain ailments. But recent studies, such as a critical review done in May of 2015, Obesity, BMI, and Health, is starting to question whether the BMI is really a predictor of health outcomes that we once thought. And maybe more of a holistic approach needs to be in order. Now, I've not always been a large woman. As you can see, this photo was taken in the 1980s. You see the mullet on my head? And if anybody here does not believe that's me, I have proof. You see the belt on my nurse's uniform? Here it is. Now you'll see, I can no longer wear this as a belt. <laughs> but maybe I could wear it as a garter for those frisky nurse nights. <laughs> What's curious to note, we're done with that, is that up until the age of 25, I weighed between 145, 135 and 145 pounds and I was viewed as a healthy young woman. If we go back to the chart, at five foot nine and 135 to 145 pounds, I was within the normal or healthy range. I may have been weight healthy, but it was the most unhealthiest time of my life. When you were viewed as normal or healthy or the correct size, nobody questions how you maintain that. I maintained that weight by consuming a lot of alcohol. Or maybe alcohol consumed a lot of me. I remember my friend Joe in England, where I lived, calling my mom in Canada and saying, don't worry, Judy, we got her back on solids. <laughs> Average-sized people are never questioned about their lifestyle, but larger-sized people are questioned all the time. Is health not about mind, body, and spirit more than just a mathematical equation? I came back to Canada at the age of 25, and became pregnant as soon as I landed. My mom asked me not to tell you that, because now you think I'm fat and promiscuous. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
But pregnancy is like a license to eat. Now, in an average pregnancy, you gain 25 to 30 pounds. I've always been an overachiever, and I gained 87. <laughs> what I wasn't prepared for was how this weight gain altered the way people viewed me. But more importantly, it altered the way I viewed myself. There's many different ways of being fat, and I have been them all. When I first became a fat person, I didn't realize how unhealthy I was, both emotionally and physically. Despite living in this body day in and day out, I didn't realize how unhealthy I'd become, and it wasn't solely a weight issue. My concept of nutrition was more about self-indulgence and comfort rather than feeling my body. When I first joined Fatty Club, I have to say, so people will call these clubs things with positive name, you know, finding yourself, new you, finding balance, but I call it what it is. So when I first joined Fatty Club, I had many Oprah aha moments. And one of my nutritional aha moments is when the trainer said, bring in your favorite snack. We're going to calculate the calories of that snack, and you're going to work it off on the elliptical. Mm. So I dutifully brought in the family-sized bag of Miss Vicky's chips. And the trainer said, how many of these would you eat? And I responded, the bag. She said, no, how many of these would you eat in one sitting? I again responded, the bag. <laughs> I knew by the look of sheer shock on her face, this was not an appropriate caloric intake. <laughs> Needless to say, I was on the elliptical for the next four days. Mm -hmm. It's true. Misconceptions persist. I have a sister. She's half the woman I am, literally. We always say she got the hips and I got the heart. Nobody questions her life choices because she's viewed as healthy. When I first trans had a transformation and began reading nutritional labels, she stopped shopping with me because she doesn't see the point of that. And nobody questions her simply by her size. Now that I'm healthier, I could teach nutrition but I haven't internalized it. Well, you know, maybe I did internalize it when I ate it, right? But when people look at me, they make the assumption right, that I need to be taught how to eat healthy. I know how to eat healthy, and I generally do, but I forget portion control. As it turns out, a wheelbarrow is not a plate. <laughs> As the adage goes, those who can do, and those who can't teach. But things are changing. We now have an app that you can download on your smartphone, right? and the, the idea of this app is to scan the barcode of your food. The app then tells you the nutritional content and the calories of that food. If you can scan the barcode of that food, is it really food? How do you scan a piece of fruit or a vegetable? When I tell people that I'm vegetarian, it always goes the same. I'm vegetarian, and I get that full body scan the look of disbelief. And I say, yeah, I'm the fattest vegetarian in Canada. Right? There's a false perception that all vegetarians are thin, wear hemp and flowers in their hair. <laughs> As you can see, I'm none of those things, yet I am a vegetarian. There's also a perception that all fat people are lazy. Now that's a memo I really wish I got. I work full time and part time. I volunteer 10 to 20 hours a week. Right? I run a home. That's a lie. I supervise the running of a home. <laughs> I parent. I grandparent. I'm a good daughter. And I still have energy to satisfy my addiction to shopping. Come, spend a day in my orthopedic sneakers and then see if you have the energy to tell me that I'm lazy. And if I was that lazy, I wouldn't have the energy and the motivation to shop, cook, and prepare all the food that it takes to have a fabulous covering of excess flesh. <laughs> But living with excess flesh comes with external and internal stigma. External stigma is stigma projected onto you by others. You do not need to accept that. Internal stigma, though, is your own inner voice. Your own inner voice is the strongest voice. Now, you may not be able to ignore your own self-talk, but it was within your power to change the message it's saying. If you change your own self-talk message, you can change your life. Another thing that's curious to me is this mindset of being fat. Many large people cripple themselves not by their weight, but being too fat in their mind to participate in life. 
At one club, we were sitting at a round table discussion, and all, the question was, what can you not do due to your weight? And there was profound answers. I can't be healthy. I can't parent. I am not worthy. I can't eat in public. I can't, I can't, I can't. I am not, I am not, I am not. Now, I'm not known to be a deep thinker, but I wanted something profound to say. I wanted to fit in, and I was stressed. Then it got to my turn, and I had it. And I confidently said, I can't fluidly get off the couch. <laughs> Now, average-sized people take this for granted, and they just kind of stand up. Right? <laughs> people my size, we kind of have to shimmy to the front, heave ourselves up. Right? But like an Olympic sport with but no dignity. Now, what I had to say maybe was not as profound, but I do not allow my weight to stop me doing anything. Many large people can, but they think they can't, so they don't, and then they stay in that crippling mindset. I work very hard not to have my self-esteem done in a negative way because of my weight. But this glorious self-esteem that I'm blessed with, that the medical community calls grandiose, is not a motivator to weight loss. Why would I change what I'm happy with? When my current partner Brian and I decided to have a baby, Brian says, let's go to the gym. He loves the gym, and he goes to the gym every day that he can, two to three hours. And he says words to me that I don't understand. He says, come on, Penny, don't you love the burn? No. Come on, Pen, don't you love the rush? No. <laughs> and I'm like, you want me to go to the gym? You call me fat? He's like, no, it's about health. It took a little while, but I eventually did agree. And Brian triumphantly says, woohoo, we'll start tomorrow. I said, we will not. I have to go shopping first. <laughs> so a week later, in the perfect outfit, we started at a local gym. There was nine of us in that club, and we're up on the track. And the trainer comes and introduces herself. And she said, what I want you to do is line up on the track, single file. Power walk, and the last one runs to the front. I was like, sorry? <laughs> She began to explain the concept again. I said, no, I understand the concept. It's the word run. I don't run. Brian, when did I last run? He's like, two years ago, there was a sale at Pennington's. <laughs> I was like, mm. But we did line up, and we did power walk. And it turns out I can be judgmental and competitive. Who knew? And off we go. And the first one runs past. And I think, oh. My outfit's better than that. Mm -hmm. right. And the second one runs fast. Oh, I'm faster than that. And it gets to be my turn. And I take off running like the wind, like this. And they're so excited that they're clapping for me. I can hear them clapping. But when I turn, their hands are clapless. And I thought, what is that noise? That would be my floopy, banging off my thighs, making a noise. <laughs> Now, there's not many of us that can do a running ovation. And there's even less of us that could be proud of it. But I turned to the group and I loudly said above the noise, look at me, I'm self applauding <laughs> It's good to have fun, and it's good to laugh at yourself while being proud of what you try. For larger people, it's very hard to go into the gym. We struggle to get through the door while people are training the body perfect. I'm told all the time, you need to exercise more, but I don't fit in the machines and trainers don't know how to train somebody this size. Those types of issues perpetuate the subtle and sometimes not so subtle shaming that goes on for large people all of the time. I've gained some emotional intelligence since then, and I try never to judge others. Judging others is not only negative to the person that you're projecting your judgment on, but it's negative to you, because it's negative energy. Now, people have said things to me in the past when I wasn't this glorious piece of self-confidence that really hurt. Now I have an answer for everything. You'd be shocked at that, wouldn't you? <laughs> People say, does your husband not mind you being fat? I say, I'm not married, I'm common law. He's common and I'm the law. <laughs> Why has that got to do with a relationship? People say, you've lost weight. Yeah, I'm ill, thanks for your support. You don't know why people's weight fluctuates. So instead of judgment, how about you stop and say, how are you? And listen to the answer and have a full engagement. Right? When is the baby due? I'm not pregnant, I'm fat. But thank you for thinking I'm young enough to have a viable egg. <laughs> That stops them. Right? You look great, you've lost weight. 
People think they're complimenting you, but reading between the lines means I looked like crap before. <laughs> and how much weight have you lost? I say the same thing. 200 pounds. <gasps> You've lost 200 pounds? Yes. I lost 10, put back on five. Lost that five, that's 15. Lost 20, put back on 40. Lost that, so now I'm at 75. And it just keeps going. <laughs> Instead of being Captain Obvious and telling me that I have to lose weight, how can family, friends, health professionals, and the media address the issue in a way that is actually resourceful? The weight gain that you see is usually a symptom of other issues going on for that person complex issues that may be psychological or medical or economic or social or something in nature for them that is very complex. And your well-meaning advice can be taken as shaming. And the communication system dies, and we withdraw further into our struggle without hope. Now, I might not be able to lose the 100 pounds that others, and that BMI scale, thinks that I should. I can't lose that today, and I can't lose that in the near future but I can make a determined effort to accept myself and be happy. I have learned to accept myself. Why can't you? I have so much self-acceptance, I'm going to share it here afterwards. Now, I am happy because I am happy. I am not happy because I'm fat. And I'm not happy despite being fat. I am just happy. I laugh at myself not as a defense mechanism, but because I think I'm funny. <laughs> People will love you as little as you love yourself. I demand to be loved, and I am worth being loved. When you look at me, see me. Not my dress size, not my excess flesh, but see me. I am 50, I am fat, and I am fabulous. My name is Penny Jones, and those are my ramblings. Thank you.